You are listening to the Effective Statistician Podcast, the weekly podcast with Alexander Schacht, Benjamin Pieske and Sam Gartner designed to help you reach your potential, lead great science and serve patients without becoming overwhelmed by work. Today we do a deep dive into what has happened over one year of wonderful Wednesday webinars. A great series on visual analytics and how we can use visualizations of data in our development process and beyond. The Data Visualization Special Interest Group is now running this webinar series over more than one year. So each month there is a webinar where we present about use cases and sketches of these use cases from the community. It's a really, really nice opportunity for you to also learn about how to improve your data visualization skills based on real cases. So, of course, the data is anonymized so that you can see, okay, how to best display, for example, Kaplan Meier curves together with confidence intervals when you have couple of different factors that you want to adjust for. All these kind of typical things that happen in clinical development and beyond. So head over to psiweb.org to learn about the SIG. You can also there join PSI because PSI is a great community for you to improve your skills. I'm producing this podcast in association with PSI because PSI is a community dedicated to leading and promoting the use of statistics within the healthcare industry for the benefit of patients. There's much more that PSI can offer, like the video on demand content library and also the upcoming conference. So head over to psiweb.org to learn more about all these amazing things. Welcome to another episode of the podcast and today I'm talking with Bodo and Steve who are running the wonderful Wednesday webinar series together with me and others from the PSI Visualization Special Interest Group or PSI and F by Visualization Special Interest Group and that's an initiative that is now ongoing for a year. Uh, as we are talking, which is really, really amazing. We have recorded 12 webinars, so on a, on a monthly basis over the year, all around visualizations and with a focus on data that is captured in medical research. So things like clinical trials, observational studies, and things like that. So welcome, Bodo, first. So maybe you can start with a short introduction of yourself and what do you love about visualization? Yeah, thanks, Alex. It's quite a long story. So I'm uh, working as a clinical statistician in the pharmaceutical industry for now uh, 20 years. And we, we started a lot for, with creating tables and uh, listings and um, actually only in the last yes, seven to eight years, it, it really started with more elaborated uh, graphics. And um, that was something that catched my interest pretty fast because that was really simplify, simplifying um, the understanding of data. And that was the idea behind that. And then I even learned a, a new language for that because uh, that was the moment where I started uh, to learn R because that's really improved uh, visualization possibilities compared to what was possible in, at that time in, with us, which now also improved. But um, And uh, that goes so far that I even started developing uh, an app in R Uh, for visualization and that um, confronted me with a lot of questions around visualization how to do best and we we had the possibilities also to talk with visualization experts at that moment so that uh, the insight was there and 
yeah, at, at, at some point at a conference, I, I met you and you put that together and said, well, actually, there's, there's a need for, for more good visualizations. And uh, yeah, well, there was no way to say no for me. <laughs> and, and now I'm pretty <laughs> happy that we have already this uh, more than one year of experience and, and a really nice group collected together uh, to learn even more about it. Yeah, it was a lot of development. It has been a common theme at the PSI conference. There were lots of sessions you presented and, and others presented. And through that, there was really a need to create this visualization special interest group. And if you scroll back in your podcast player to about a year ago, there's another interview with uh, Mark and Rachel which also talks about the wonderful Wednesday and the uh, visualization special interest group, where you can learn more about it. So now let's go to Steve. You are also an integral part of the uh, special interest group. What was your career looking uh, like up to now and how did you came into touch with visualizations? Okay, thanks, Alexander. Yeah, so my name's uh, Steve Mallet. I, I work at GSK. Um, I guess I've always been interested interested you know, since my MSc days really in in kind of um, challenges and how you, how you visualize data but I think at GSK about 15 years ago um, we had an initiative to be kind of more proactive in in-stream safety data monitoring and, and out of that initiative arose renewed interest in, in, in graphics for kind of sig um, safety signal det detection so I, I got involved in that project um, and the kind of scope broadened really to increase the use of graphics at, at that time study reports were just mainly tables and listings so yeah I worked on a team that kind of developed um, a kind of graphics library and standard tools um, for developing graphics so that was one activity where I spent a lot of time outside my normal project work on, on, on data viz so that, that kind of came to an end. People left the company and, and kind of moved on to projects. So about three years ago, I think, my interest was kind of re renewed with, we had someone join the company who is very much an advocate. They ran a GG Plots course. Um, I read Hadley Wickham's paper, Grammar of Graphics. Um, and that kind of can really reshape how I thought about data visualization um, and how rather than it's about you know, choosing a graph from a library or you know, and the kind of standardization approach that we were using. It's, it's really using the grammar of graphics was to think about your data and how you can represent that data in different ways. And it's almost endless possibilities to create kind of graphs that may not even, even have a name. I, I found that quite inspiring. So I started doing, uh, getting involved at GSK and applying some of those methods to my projects. And then, yeah, I learned about the special interest group um, about a year ago. Um, very interested. It was, it was kind of the right time for me. I was looking for more involvement in PSI. Um, so I, I joined and, yeah, the rest is history. So I, I've been almost from the start. I think I probably missed the first one or two, but I've, I've been involved in, in most of the, um, the webinars so far. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And if you wonder what the GG in GG plot uh, stands for that's Grammar of Graphics, and uh, we'll link to that into in the show notes. So just head over to the effective statistician.com, and there you will find the link to this one, as well as the link to you know the webinars that we are talking about, the, the blog of the visualization special interest group, and also the homepage where you can register for these webinars because all these webinars are free for everybody to uh, to look. And all the recordings of the webinars are also free there. So just head over to the homepage and find the links there and register for the next episode uh, of, so for the next webinar that is coming up. Every second month, every second Wednesday of the month, I wanted to say. Okay, so let's, go a little bit into visualization as a topic. Bodo, what have you learned about data visualization in the last year from all the different wonderful Wednesday webinars? Oh, I, I learned quite a lot. So um, uh, as I started, uh, I was quite into visualizations already and still I, I learned a lot. So I even, even learned uh, new kinds of visualizations 
um, and uh, that, that some visualizations can even be used in our uh, area. Like, for example, the upset plot was a plot that I haven't used because I uh, haven't seen it useful for what I for what I do. But uh, uh, now, having discussed it uh, multiple times, there is a really good good way to uh, use it. And uh, the biggest learning on graphics overall, I think, is that there is no overall perfect graph. It always very much depends on the message you want to deliver. So that's, I think, um, the, the major takeaway to say, what message do you want to bring across and then choose uh, the right graph for that? Because there's not the right graph for the data. There's only the right graph. For the message i think that's yeah. the, the biggest learning i took from that and that actually uh, even if you think the graph is okay and actually bring the message across it's always worthwhile to ask someone else and look at the graph and if he understands because if you're already in the data you have some pre-bias <laughs> looking at the graph and asking someone who's uh, the first time looking on the plot on the graph and what he understands, what he sees or she, that is uh, of very much value. And that actually makes the Wonderful Wednesday so, so interesting because you get opinions from, from a lot of people together. Yeah, what I learned is there's so many different aspects of data visualizations that I have never thought about before, you know choose of color palettes and, you know, whether a bar chart is better than a scatter plot or something else, all these kind of different things. See how you, where you put the legends and whether you have legends at all. And, uh, you know, all these little things like tick marks and grid lines and using of grays. There's so many different aspects in data visualization that I wasn't aware about before. You mentioned the upset graph. Can you describe a little bit how that looks like and what are kind of the problems that you can solve with that graph? Yeah, actually the upset graph is a kind of multi-graph. So you normally have a kind of histogram or a bar chart on the top that shows you frequencies of occurrences of something. And that something actually can just be described right below that graph. This might be combinations uh, of events that might be other co-occurrences that may be displays or, um, or different uh, circumstances in, in that describe the, the numbers above. So um, I found it very useful for co-occurrences of, of adverse events. We had a, such an example in the Wonderful Wednesday Yes, we've seen all these adverse events uh, co-occur and you have the list of adverse events below and having these dots connected uh, where actually those uh, come up uh, at the same time and then the frequency of this co-occurrence on the top of it. And you have, and you have sometimes you can use left of it uh, in a, another bar chart uh, for additional information on the single adverse events so that's that was quite quite useful but the difficulty as you're asking on that is to choose the right options to be displayed mm. because a complete display is often too crowded so you really have to think on the message you want to bring across on uh, and choose wisely what to display and uh, then it can be very helpful yeah, we'll put a link to these kind of upset plots in the show notes as well, so that you can have a look at that when you're maybe back from your running while you're hearing this. I also learned about this plot first time in the webinar series, and I was always wondering if kind of if you have a you know a Venn diagram with you know three things, then that's pretty easy to show. But if you have four, five, six, or ten different um, groups and you have all these kind of different combinations it's pretty much impossible to 
you know, using a Venn diagram. And there the upset graph is a really, really nice option. Steve, what about you? What were your main learnings from the wonderful Wednesday webinar series? Yeah, I mean, just to extend what Bodo was saying, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we talk a lot about on the panel about, you know, is a graph exploratory or explanatory and, and you know, what's the message? And so I think, I think that's what's the biggest impact for me has been to think more deeply about, you know, the, the, who's going to be the end, the end user, if you like, or the customer. So I think beforehand, you know, if you're thinking, if you have a continuous variable and you're interested in its distribution and you might previously have thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll produce a box plot kind of job done and you know if i showed you a box plot so probably most people on this call that understand it whereas you know if i showed it to somebody who's never seen the box plot before they'd probably just stare at it and it would have no no meaning so rather than that two-step process of going from your data to you know visual representation of the data i think the third step is kind of what's going on inside the brain of the person looking at it <laughs> um and that might be so i mean maybe another another example i think we one we had quite recently was as an animated plot where um, individual patient data was being shown and the, and the dots were moving along a scale representing some disease severity and kind of coded according to the treatment. And that's very obvious. You could give that to most people and they would, they would understand what was going on there um, because it's using, it's kind of using qualities that are hardwired into most people's brains. We all know, you know, that if, if something's moving in, um, in, in a certain direction it means there's a change so these are called you know sometimes they're called pre-attentive qualities but it's basically the way our, all our brains are hardwired to understand these so the graph like that doesn't really on the um webinar we didn't really have much to say because it was so obvious what was going on um whereas the same data you might have like a lasagna plot or something which is not obvious straight away what's what's going on that, that needs it's a lot maybe a lot richer um but requires some sort of training or explanation and, and, and takes more time to train the person who's receiving that data to, to, to understand the message. So, you know, I think that's important to think about is, you know, so I'm, I guess I'm quite interested in cognition and how a graph is, is interpreted. I mean, something else we often show is, is you see graphs with, with a key at the bottom, maybe quite small, and then the that's creating what's called a cognitive load. The person's constantly moving backwards and forwards between, okay, that's a red line. What does that mean? They're going to the key. If you can put the key in the data or, or have labels in the data, then the person's not having to work so hard to decode that graph. And it, uh, so I think that's one thing I've learned is really just to think more about the end user. I mean, I think, I think in the farm industry, you know, and users, if you like, they're, they're educated people. And, you know, you, you, if you take, I believe if you take the time, they, they can understand quite complicated graphs. I mean, at, at GSK and our governance boards, we quite often present Bayesian posterior probabilities <laughs> um, to, you know, senior managers. And that, that's, that they, they understand those. It's taken some time to get there through training, but, but they can understand, what, kind of get the information out of those plots. So I think, you know, if you take the time, um, then I think you know most most of our co-workers are probably capable of understanding these these plots, but you wouldn't want to put something like that on a on a poster in a medical conference or something where where you've got very limited attention. Yeah, completely agree. I think you know if you have something in a you know internal team meeting where you know there's just the colleagues of you, everybody is kind of generally familiar with the data with the disease state. It's you can have much more time to explain things. At a conference, you know, maybe this presenter is showing that just for 30 seconds or a minute. So then it needs to be much easier to grasp and, you know, you need to directly get the message or, you know, at a poster, it's, it's yet another different thing. You have no presenter whatsoever. So it needs to completely stand on its own. If that then carries maybe through in promotional material that, you know, uh, sales reps use, then it's yet another completely different topic. So I think I realized how much we need to individualize Z graphics for all these different purposes. That it's not just, you know, we have one graphic that we put into the uh, study report and then we can copy and paste that everywhere else. That just doesn't work about i think it's about uh, translating 
it's translating some information you see into information. So then there are informations that are not easy to be translated and there are uh, some that are easy. So height, you can display as height. Of course, that is fine length too. Um, there's difficulty, with some, for example, with pain. Pain you cannot directly uh, uh, transport in a graph. So you need to translate that into a length, for example. Uh, more pain uh, lengths or in a color. And uh, the example Steve brought up, the, the animated scatter plot, this is easy to understand because you have less translation. Time need not to be translated into length or something or position. Time is still time because it's animated over time. And that makes the graph easy to understand. And if we reduce the number of translations needed, um, then it's easy to understand. And if there are translations that are more complicated, as Steve said, you can train people on recognizing this information anyway. And uh, that is a good point, or you can learn um, by using graphics, graphics very powerfully. Yeah, and I think what I, what I also learned is with the pandemic happening basically more or less at the same time as we are doing the webinar series, there's a much more use of visualizations in the in the newspapers in on the internet uh, i think visualizations become more sophisticated also for the lay audience and so um, there's an increased data literacy ongoing on and i think that's that's another really really good part steve what makes this webinar series so special for you I think it's the kind of variety and and creativity that we that we see. I mean, we we see um, a lot of different graphs. Some of them are more traditional. Some of them are crazy and weird. Um, you know, so I think it's it's never a dull moment, really. I mean, I, I really look forward to we have meetings on, in two days before the webinar where we where we review all the submissions, and I really enjoy those meetings. And it's just interesting to see, you know, how many different ways that a particular problem can be can be approached and and. It's, it's really interesting and you know there's never one correct way it's, it's really just different kind of perspectives so yeah I, th I, I, th I think I enjoy the creativity um, and, and I learn a lot as Bodo says I mean, over the last year I, I've, I've learned a, 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 hu a huge amount yeah I mean I just in, I enjoy the webinars themselves apparently we're, we're a good team we've got to know each other quite well there's got a lot, lot of humor and uh, a lot of enthusiasm and passion and i think that's coming through in the contributors as well we get we're starting to get an increase in the contributions and the increase in the kind of creativity so there's obviously kind of passion out there in our in, in our kind of uh, community and hopefully the community continues to to grow yeah yeah i completely agree it's as always fun humor uh because there's no you know absolute right or wrong as I may be for pie charts, <laughs> there's always, you know, a lot of laughter and lots of kind of comments. And uh, we are all sharing kind of things with each other. We have complementary knowledge experience and that makes it so, so fun and, and interesting. Is there any specific visualization that, you know, stands out for you, Steve, something that you remember, wow, that was really, really good. Yes, I mean, there was a, but Boda mentioned the challenge where we had, we were looking at adverse event terms and trying to look at kind of clusters of events. So adverse events that co-occurred and there was a, a shiny app, which I quite liked. So that was allowed us to look at groups of preferred terms that, that occur at the same time. So you could look at for particular combinations and how many patients had those events co-occurring and, and looking at the duration. So you, that was useful for, I think that would be useful for kind of signal detection or, or looking at clusters of events. And you could, because it was an interactive shiny app, you could, you had different options around display and, and sorting. Um, and then you could, um, switch to patient level view as well. So you're looking at the kind of um, a profile of what kind of time course throughout the study in terms of study day and, and kind of visualize at, a, at an individual patient level when those events were um, occurring and co-occurring. And I think that's quite powerful because you know, that, that's answering questions you wouldn't really be able to uh, answer just from, from regular tables. Um, and I think 
being able to maybe give that app to a kind of safety person or medical writer um, and let them play. I mean, I, I just found myself playing with that for quite a long time. <laughs> and there's a, there's a lot of options that, that you could use. So, I mean, it wasn't perfect. So I think maybe with this new world of shiny apps, maybe we're moving more towards a kind of more agile way of working where you might um, you know, provide a, a kind of initial version of a, an app to a stakeholder and then they might say well please kind of have this feature or that feature um and, and rather than in the old days where you know you develop something and just throw it over the wall you know and say there you go i think it might be more of a collaboration with, with our stakeholders but i think the challenge is with things like shiny apps you know in our kind of gcp environment we work in you know how do you ensure validation um so you know there's a bit of a tension there i think between like agile flexible working and the kind of formalities of of validation because obviously with safety that you can't take chances <laughs> or consequences of a mistake may, may be disastrous really so i think that's probably something that's still being being worked through i think any any kind of interactivity uh, in the graph i think is that's something relatively new to me and I, I quite enjoy that yeah i really love when you can see the individual patient level data yes yeah, so you can much better understand distributions uncertainties things like that if you hover over it, you can see additional information that, you know, otherwise you would, you know, find the uh, data, uh, the subject number, and then look through listings or things like that. And with these individual patient level data embedded in your visualization, you can so fast understand the, the different data in, in a much better way than it was never possible with, with tables and listings. So that's, that's really, really cool. Uh, Bodo, what about you? What made the webinar series so special for you? Yeah, well, Steve, I can agree with Steve. It's just um, this multiplicity. So you have so many people from different companies there together, all with different backgrounds, so many different opinions, and you learn how to improve also your own graphics. So I was also able to present one of the our shiny apps that we developed at Bear at one of the webinars and to see how others react. So that was discussed internally, of course, and it was used already. So, but still uh, seeing how other reacts to this graphical representation and what ideas actually came up to improve it, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And of course, worthwhile then to take that back and really improve the visualizations we have. And uh, that, is, that is great. And that people from different companies actually work together. And now since a year doing these webinars, that's just great. It's really amazing how much content we have produced in this one year. It's, it's, it's outstanding. So in terms of <clears throat> my favorite um, visualizations, actually the subgroup explorer that, that you presented uh, definitely belongs to that because I can see in my world how often I would use it and how much easier it makes makes my life in, in many different ways. And we have already implemented it for a couple of different projects internally. So uh, that had a direct impact on my work, as well as a couple of other things that we discussed. I, uh, it was not just for learning. It had lots of direct in, impact on different projects that I was working on. What were your... It was actually the history of that because we remembered uh, a lot of submissions we have done in the past. And uh, in preparation of that, um, the clinicians always ask for subgroups. How does the results look or the safety profile look in that and that subgroup? And then of course we came up with a new table presenting the data in that subgroup. And the next question was, okay, but combining that subgroup with that subgroup, how does that look like? And we go, went back and, and did the analysis and days later, table was ready. And that was very um, unfortunate for both sides. So for the, for the statisticians to do the work, but also for the clinicians have to wait three days for, for the result. So that was actually an, a, a point where we said, okay, there must be a better way. There must really be a better way to, to get that uh, discussion working much faster. And then we came up uh, with, with the subgroup Explorer. You just click on the subgroup, you combine what you want, and then 
you get the results and that not only in a table, but really in relation to all the other subgroups, where is that subgroup actually related with regard to safety or efficacy or whatever you want. And that was from a statistical point, no big step forward. So it's not no complicated analysis in there, but the visualization itself was so helpful that we really uh, had regular discussions and what take weeks before with back and forth we could just solve in a discussion with visual uh, support in one hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it speeds up the process immensely. It's 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 really really good. Any any other visualization that was your favorite one? Yeah, we talked about that. The actually the animated scatter plot that was really uh, really nice to see how if you have multiple measurements over time. That's a really nice way to display it, and people immediately grab the information you don't have to explain much so they're used to scatter plot most of them and now you see it animated and, and it just the information just flows in so that's great yeah there's another really nice example um, that was published on uh, flowing data where you see kind of different the life of americans and um, it's a different you know, things that people do like sleep, uh, eat, work, leisure time. Um, these are all displayed uh, in, in different colors. And then you see the individual people moving between these different colors and these different uh, parts. So, so, and that is also really, really nice display. And then you see the time running, yeah, uh, in the background, you can see, okay, 6 a.m. in the morning, people start to wake up and then, you know, at 8 a.m. they get to work and, and so on. And um, this kind of using movement in, in visualizations is something that is rather new. You can't do it on printed paper that we <laughs> used to use. And uh, so that's a really, really nice feature. But it also makes it so attractive to look into the visualization. So I think the... What I also learned a lot is about the, you know, the beauty in visualizations and how you can make things attractive and therefore also attract people to actually engage with it. You know? So that's another interesting aspect that we maybe as statisticians and mathematicians are not so used to that, you know, these artistic aspects also come into play. Now, th I think we can learn from uh, people like Hans Rosling. You know, if you look at his videos on, on YouTube, I mean, he turns turns this into a, a performance, <laughs> you know, um, and you know, I think he I think he compares data visualization to art and music. <laughs> you know, he says it, it is like a performance. It, you, you see the data come to life, literally. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, I'd encourage people that haven't seen Hans Rosling to check him out on, on YouTube. Yeah, I also put the respective link into the blog post. This Joy of Stats video with the BBC is an outstanding thing. And at the time, probably, you know, required lots of investment into um, technical things. But now you can do lots of these things, you know, on your own laptop. Yeah, And you don't need a complete filming crew and things like that altogether. So there's a lot of things that are now possible that was kind of completely new at the time when Hans Rosling did it. It actually inspired me with the animated scatter plot as well. So that was that was really good. So we that is there's one thing in it that I also really love about the wonderful Wednesday series, and that is the community approach. Um, it's not just, you know, the people that sp sit in the special interest group that participated in, but, you know, a bigger community that submits all the different um, visualizations. So if you haven't heard about the wonderful Wednesday, it works like this. Every second Wednesday in the month, we have a webinar where we present the and discuss the visualizations that were submitted. And then we also give a new data set that people can use for the next challenge. And then they have usually three or four weeks to work on these visualizations and submit them back to the SIG to get feedback. 
Now, everybody can do that. And that is one of the other nice things. We have seen people from all over the world submitting things to the special interest group. And I think there's a lot of positives in submitting your visualization. So Steve Bodo, what would you recommend to people that think about submitting their visualization? I think my message would just be, um, you know, just, just, just don't be afraid to have a go, really. I mean, there, there are, as we said, you know, there's quite a wide variety of, um, let's say, ability levels. We get very complicated things. We get, we get very simple things. Um, so, um, you know, just um, we're very, we're very um, positive in our critique. <laughs> so we'll always be kind <laughs> and give, give kind feedback. So, you know, see it as an opportunity, maybe just to develop a little bit of coding skills or to, to start you know, to think about visualization in a new way and start to develop your own abilities. But, you know, it's a good way to learn is just by, by, by doing with, with, with real examples. So, I mean, one, one thing, I, and I've submitted a few entries myself and I've, and I've learned a bit of, GG plots. I mean, I, I'm I'm a dyed in the wool SAS user. I've used SAS for many years, but don't be afraid to learn a bit of bit of R because I, I do. I personally, you know, find R is in a lot more intuitive and easier. I mean, I I might do manipulation and derive variables in SAS, uh, and then and then do the last bit in R, in R as a sort of hybrid. So, um, but you know, the the, t the tool is not the most important thing. But I I, I just find with with GG plot it doesn't get in the way because the, the the coding is very intuitive. Um, I don't need to grab the manual too much and try and get worry about the syntax. Yeah, I just think have a go. Don't be afraid to try it out. And uh, as I said earlier, you know, maybe think about the audience and the message, and and, and probably keep it, you know, keep it simple and and concentrate on kind of simple message. Bodo, what would be your recommendation? Just do it. Yeah, I can only agree. <laughs> and let's be said, the the most important thing is the idea. It's not the programming skills is the idea and uh, don't be afraid to send something simple simple graphs can actually be very powerful and they're very concentrated on the message and there are very complex things we, we get and uh, these are mostly exploratory so they can just look in a lot of from a lot of angles on the data that's of course very useful but both are very needed <laughs> in in our daily life so you, sometimes you just need one simple graph that gets the message, message across, or you just have no idea and want to dive into the data. Whatever you need, there, is, there are so many ways to get that done. Uh, just try out and learn. I also think just try out. And, you know, if you're maybe not good at programming or maybe you're not good on the visualization uh, side, Maybe team up with someone else, yeah? A colleague, a peer, a friend, uh, could be at another company. It doesn't need to be, you know, the colleagues that you're directly working with. It could be a colleague you have worked with in the past and that now sits at another company because all these data is freely available. It's, you know, it looks like clinical trial data, but it is not kind of, you know, real patient level data. So you can work together on that. And um, put it into your, you know, monthly calendar to reserve some time to learn about it. I think it's probably also good to explain to your supervisor why that will help you with um, becoming better at visualizations in your day-to-day -day work and how attending these webinars will help you to improve uh, your work as well. And... If you don't know how that actually looks like, yeah, just head over to our um, to this homepage here that uh, on the that we recommend on the on the blog for this episode, where you can see the recordings from previous webinars, and you can see that Steve is absolutely right. We are not kind of um, unkind. We are actually, you know talking about these different things. We are always highlighting positive things. We are always, you know, talk about ways to improve or different perspectives. There's no right or wrong. And so um, and there's always an iterative process. Even people like Alberto Cairo sometimes mess it up completely the first time. So if people like gurus like these sometimes mess it up, 
why shouldn't we? Feel free to submit something and uh, play a little bit with it. You can only benefit from it. And of course, also uh, increases your exposure. Yeah, so if you do that a couple of times, maybe then, you know, people recognize, oh, there's a talented person sitting there. Hmm, I have an opening for a job. Maybe I should contact that person. So who never knows? <laughs> Okay. Any final points for the podcast today, Steve? Um, I mean, just one thing to spring to mind when you were speaking is, you know, maybe people can work in teams to submit entries. To, to so, you know, for example, if one person draws a sketch, and you know, starting with as Gerardo says with, with the idea, so you can sketch an idea, and 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 then it, it may be somebody else that does the programming work, or and you, as a team, you you could you could develop. Yeah, it's it, certainly the idea of community. Is, is important and you know it's nice to see the number of attendees growing we're, we're, we're currently talking about ways of maybe increasing the interactivity a little bit during during the webinars themselves and you know we also have people quite active on LinkedIn and, and so on so I think that's part of the way forward maybe for the next 12 months <laughs> is, is thinking you know about how to grow grow the community um, and you know and get a kind of conversation going more generally Bodo, what's your key message for the listener? Yeah, it's it's on purpose that we're doing that. Visualizations are so important uh, to really um, get messages across and understand data. And I think uh, that is a good way to learn how to do that very effectively. And maybe use that in your own company or for your own projects that you're on. And that can be very useful, although the way might be a little bit bothersome for first learning some new skills, but it's worthwhile. And it's once you get over the first steps, it's really fun. Yeah. And we have set up this webinar in a way that we all envision would be kind of perfect training look like for us. It's data sets that we are used to. It's you know, things that we can directly apply to our projects. It's not kind of artificial. It's you talk to other statisticians about it. Um, it's not too much additional workload. So have fun with it and enjoy it. Thanks, Bodo and Steve, for this really, really nice discussion about the wonderful Wednesday webinar series. And we'll keep in touch over the next months, hopefully next years to get more and more of these wonderful Wednesday webinars. Yeah, thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. This show was created in association with PSI. Thanks to Rain who helps with the show in the background and thank you for listening. Head over to theeffectivestatistician.com to find much more, including lots of free resources on visualization. There's a couple of webinars there and other things. So head over there and you can download all these things for free. Reach your potential, lead brain science and serve patients. Just be an effective statistician.